This is our second le lecture on the nervous system. Today we're going to be looking at how nerves are stimulated and things called action potentials which you maybe have heard about before. Before we get into the action potential though, I want to talk a little bit more about nerves. There, we, already, we already looked at a neuron and how there's a neuron cell body. And the interesting thing is that most of the cell bodies are found in the central nervous system. So remember from last lecture, the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. That means that the majority of those cell bodies are found either in the brain or in the spinal cord. Remember a neuron has an axon, so you have some sort of cell body, and then you have the axon, which is a long process goes out to different parts of the body and so this cell body this is the part that's in the central nervous system so you may have a cell body located in the spinal cord and then from there the axon will then leave the spinal cord and go into the, pe the peripheral nervous system and it will take the, the signal to wherever it needs to go cell bodies are not myelinated so only the axon has that myelination on it. And so the unmyelinated cell body is what we call the gray matter. And you see this in the, both of the brain and the spinal cord. And we'll, we'll look at a few pictures of gray matter. So there's gray matter and there's what's called white matter. White matter looks white because it has the myelination. The gray matter does not have myelination and so it looks, we call it gray matter. Alright, then we have things called ganglia. And ganglia are where we have collections of cell bodies outside the nervous system, outside the central nervous system. So again, most, most of the cell bodies are found in the central nervous system, but sometimes we get these collections of, of these cell bodies outside the central nervous system, and they form these little bumps. And we call these ganglia. So for example, okay, here's our spinal cord. And what we have here, so our spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. Notice we have on the inside here, we have some gray matter. But the divisions of the uh, peripheral nervous system and the first two main divisions were the afferent or the sensory system and the efer e uh, efferent or the motor system division of the peripheral nervous system and here you see examples of that. So we have the afferent sensory, efferent, the motor uh, neurons here. Okay, so here's our cell body outside, here's our cell body inside. Green matter is the un unmyelinated areas here. In this case the afferent neurons, cell body is found outside the CNS and this is always the case. So this is the afferent uh, neurons are always going to have their cell body outside. The efferent or the motor neurons are always going to have their cell bodies in the CNS. Then we have one other little neuron here. This green one in the middle. And it's called an interneuron. So notice the whole neuron is found in the CNS. Its cell body is found in the, the spinal cord. But it connects the afferent pathway to the efferent pathway. We'll talk about uh, a little bit about reflexes. But we have a signal coming here into the CNS. It can go through this interneuron and then go back through, back out through the efferent uh, neurons here. So, the, so that's what that little guy there is doing, connecting those two systems there. So the afferent, the sensory neurons, they're able to pick out, pick up information or re receive uh, stimuli from the outside uh, world and. There's a number of different specialized receptors that are able to do that, and we're not going to talk much about them here, but there's a lot of them you're fa familiar with. So there's pain receptors, there's touch receptors, there's even, even receptors that can sense stretching of muscles or stretching of tissues uh, that will pick up those signals as well. We have uh, other pressure receptors that are, are what are called deep pressure receptors. We saw some of these when we looked at the integumentary system. But the afferent, system, the afferent pathway is able to pick up all these signals and then take it to the, 
to the uh, central nervous system, then the central nervous system is able to send out a signal through the motor neurons to decide to tell the body how to react to whatever stimulus they're receiving. So neurons have to be able to be irritated, they have to be able to pick up a stimulus, and then they have to be able to send that stimulus out somewhere else. And so now we're going to talk about how that happens. We're going to talk about something called an action potential, or a nerve impulse. Before we do that though, I want to remind you a few things about cells. When we talked about cells earlier in this semester, we talked about how cells have a plasma membrane. So these two lines I drew here, this is representing an axon. So an axon is a part of a cell, and that means that this axon has a plasma membrane surrounding the cell. And the reason this is important is because the plasma membrane is semi-permeable. So some things can get, get through the membrane all by itself, some things can't. So we talked about before how oxygen can diffuse freely through the membrane. CO2 can diffuse freely through the membrane. Water can also move easily through the membrane. Some things, like ions, on the other hand, cannot. So for example, Na positive has a positive charge. It says one less electron than, than a proton. It cannot go through the membrane because of that charge. Other things like potassium also cannot get through the membrane by themselves. And the reason this is important is because these ions are what allow the nerve impulse to happen. So because, of, because they can't get through the membrane by themselves, this allows a, a nerve impulse to happen. So we're going to look at how a nerve, nerve impulse moves down the axon. So, what we're looking at here, we have the, the neuron here, and we're just looking at a little patch of the axon, similar to what I drew in that, in that slide before, but they already have it drawn here for us. In a resting neuron, one that is not sending a signal, it's not sending any sort of signal down the axon, in resting conditions, there are ions on the inside and outside of this axon. On the outside, you have a lot of sodium ions and there are very few sodium ions on the inside but on the inside you have a lot of potassium ions and very few potassium ions on the outside what this means is that because there's all these sodium ions on the outside and they're all positively charged you end up with a positive what we call a membrane potential or it's, a, it's a, basically an electrical condition and as we talk about this, think about it like an electrical signal. What we're doing is we're actually sending an electrical signal down the nerve. And so this positive charge over here is caused by the, the sodium ions. On the inside, we have a negative resting potential. The potassium ion is also positively charged, but there's other proteins and things in here that have a negative charge. So even though we have positively charged potassium, on the inside of the axon, because of the other things inside the cell, we have a negative uh, charge. So positive on the outside, negative on the inside. What happens when the neuron gets a stimulus, or when it's sending a stimulus down the axon, what happens is what's called depolarization. So sodium can't get through the membrane by itself, but there are little sodium channels, protein channels that allow sodium to get through. Usually they're not open, but when the neuron is going to send a signal, it opens these sodium channels and allows the sodium to rush inside the cell. So now this positive charge is on the outside, now you have all these positive ions moving to the inside, that's going to change the membrane potential on the inside of this axon. It's going to become positively charged. And we call this depolarization. So it happens just at this one spot here. But as sodium, sodium ions start to rush in, notice now that our we now have a negative charge on the outside just in this area, and we have a positive charge on the inside. When this depolarization happens, it starts a, it starts a kind of a flow, a, a signal that's going to continue down. So this action potential or this depolarization is going to continue down the axon, meaning that all along the axon, the sodium channels are going to open and sodium is going to come rushing inside the axon and it's going to reverse 
this resting potential. So now all along the inside, we're going to have positive. All along the outside, we're going to have negative. It's going to continue to move down the axon. This is our electrical signal. It starts at one side of the axon, and then once that's depolar depolarization begins, that action potential is going to move clear down the axon, clear until the end. So once depolarization begins, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to move clear until the end of the axon. It doesn't stop. So it's somewhat similar to a muscle contraction. We say the muscle contraction is all or nothing. You can't just go halfway. Once it begins, it goes clear until the end. Same thing with this action potential here. Once it begins, once that depolarization happens, this is going to propagate clear until the end of the, of the neuron. There are some instances that the that it's not the stim stimulus is not strong enough, so you'll just have a slight depolarization. It will move back to its resting potential, but once that depolarization totally happens, it's going to propagate clear until the end. And now you've sent a signal down the um, the axon, and that's how our nerves are able to send these impulses from one from one side clear down the axon to where it's either going to meet a muscle or it's going to meet a nerve and continue that the propagation of the signal from our central nervous system. Once this happens though, a second signal cannot be sent down that same neuron until we get back to the original conditions that we had. So these signals are constantly being sent down the neurons, but once depolarization happens, so the inside's positive, the outside's negative, you can't send another signal until you get back to the resting potential, which was positive on the outside and negative on the inside. So after the sodium ions come rushing in and you have this action potential moving down the neuron, what's going to happen next is called repolarization. And in this case, what happens is the sodium ions now begin rushing out of the cell. So the sodium uh, channels open and I mean the potassium channels open and potassium ions rush out and now we're going to move this this resting potential we're going to move back to the resting potential because now we're going to have positive on the outside negative on the inside but at this point it's caused by potassium here we still have lots of sodium on the inside and this is going to propagate back down down the axon clear until the end it's going to follow that action potential but we're still not ready to send a new signal because we have sodium on the inside and potassium on the outside. We need to flip those around. And this is where the sodium-potassium pump comes in. Way back in one of the early lectures, we talked about an active transport. And we talked a little bit about the sodium-potassium pump as that active transport. And this is where, this is one of the places it comes into play, one of the major places it comes into play in our body. Because the sodium potassium pump's job is to re, uh, re return this axon to its resting potential, to, that, uh, to the initial conditions. So we're going to have positive on the outside, negative on the inside, but that's going to be caused by sodium ions found on the outside, potassium found on the inside. So what the sodium potassium pump does, is it pumps, it actively pumps sodium ions outside the axon and as it does that it's able to actively pump potassium ions back inside uh, back inside the um, axon, inside the cell. And it's active transport because it takes energy. So ATP is needed in order for this to happen. Now the reason it's an active transport is because as you're moving these sodium ions outside, you're going to get a large concentration. You're going to get a large concentration of sodium ions. They're not going to want more sodium ions out there, so you have to have to actively push them out against their concentration gradient. And the same thing with the potassium ions. You're you're creating a large gradient of potassium ions as you bring them back inside the cell. So if, if you were to make a hole in the membrane, they'd naturally want to flow out. They'd want to diffuse out. But because they can't go through the membrane, you can create this large concentration gradient. Kind of like a, if you think of the plasma me membrane like a dam, you're pushing these potassium ions inside so they're held back by this dam. The same thing with the sodium, they're on the outside, held back by this dam. And that creates this resting potential. It's like a trigger. And then once you receive that signal, Sodium ion channels open, sodium comes rushing in, and you have this action potential moving down the neuron.
That is how action potentials happen. That's the electrical system that allows our nerves to send the signals up and down and stimulate all parts of our body. This was a kind of a little bit of an overview of how that works. Um, I encourage you to look at some some videos, some animations about how depolarization, repolarization, well, depolarization, action potential, repolarization, and re, uh, returning to initial conditions happen. So you can kind of see a little animation about how these things work.